and uh, if you have a phone on you, would you put it silent now, please? Yes. Yeah. yes. Sorry about that. Um, our uh, guest tonight, uh, who's going to be on the conversation with me, um, is uh, Jan Mitchell, who is president of the Centre for Freedom and Prosperity, and that's a pro market public uh, policy organization that we founded in the year 2000. His major research interest includes tax reform, uh, international tax competition, the economic burden of government spending, you must tell me about it, and uh, other fiscal policy issues. He worked at the Heritage Foundation and the Cato Institute in, uh, in Washington, D.C. Um, he has uh, some years of experience uh, authoring, authoring uh, papers, writing editorials in newspapers, working for the public policy community, presenting free market viewpoint um, in the media. Um, and he speaks to a wide variety of groups. He and I did the free market uh, roadshow in a couple of countries uh, earlier this year. Um, and he's uh, also on the board of the Cayman Financial Review, and he holds a PhD in economics from George Mason University. So, you sound like, Daniel, the sort of man that can tell us how to get out of our economic difficulties. <laughs> it shouldn't be too difficult for you. Um, so, why, did you, why do you think the mini budget went so spectacularly wrong? Was it the sheer scale of the energy price cap or the unfunded tax cuts or markets simply not believing the, the, the point side agenda or bad communication or the pension problem with LDIs uh, or the Bank of England just not knowing what, what it was doing? You know, what source of it do you think? Well, I think all well, of the above is probably the uh, most accurate answer. Uh, I as an outsider who lives uh, right outside of Washington, D.C. in the U.S., obviously I don't have my finger on the pulse of the political uh, currents in, uh, in the U.K., but there's no question that, at least from a U.S. perspective, all of those issues were touched on and mentioned, but the dominant news coverage of this is that, oh, supply-side economics was tried, the market immediately reacted negatively to it, uh, we shouldn't do the same thing in the U.S., uh, this is a nail in the coffin for the whole agenda of limited government. Now, virtually none of the coverage, I mean, maybe if you're reading the Wall Street Journal editorial page or some Bloomberg articles or something like that, maybe if you're reading those things, you realize that there was this big expensive energy price cap scheme, uh, that there was uh, there were concerns about, well, where's the future spending constraint? But nobody understands or follows you know, the Bank of England creating potentially yeah. fragile financial system because of years of easy money policy. And by the way, that's something that we have to be concerned about in the U.S. as well. So, so the coverage from a U.S. perspective has been incomplete, but overwhelmingly negative to for the kinds of policy that you and I care about. Yeah, well, I'll send him, mate. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, I, mean, I mean, a lot of the blame, it seems to me, must... Uh, must fall on the Bank of England, um, just letting the, the pension things get out of control and not raising rates. I mean, they raised rates the day before the main budget, but not by as much as anybody would expect. So they've been all over the place in terms of monetary policy. I mean, not a monetary policy, but they've been much more recent. You know, they, they just they don't seem to know what they're doing. Well, I don't know whether it's that they don't know what they're doing or they just believe the wrong thing. Uh, I think the problem that we've had with central banks. Once the pandemic hit, both the Federal Reserve in the US and the European Central Bank increased their balance sheets by $4 trillion over a space of about 18 months to 24 months. The Bank of England increased their balance sheet by about a trillion. Now, yeah. smaller economy, but so proportionately something uh, of similar magnitude. Now, I've always been of the belief that when the pandemic hit, there was a reason for central banks to panic because we didn't know we were all going to die or something like that. And a lot of them thought this could be 2008 all over again. So by all means, flood the economy with liquidity so nothing freezes up. That was the rationale. And I guess maybe that made sense. Lender of last remark, blah, 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 the role of central banks. The problem is once we got to the summer of 2020, when it was apparent we all weren't going to die, and then once we got to the fall, when it was obvious vaccines were going to be rolled out, central banks kept going. It's not that they stopped and kept all that additional liquidity in the system, they kept going. 
and they kept going all the way pretty much up until uh, you know the early to mid part of this year. Now all of a sudden, oops, we created a lot of inflation by creating all this money, and they've been trying to raise interest rates and you know do other things to soak up that excess liquidity. But the Bank of England's been a laggard on. Uh, they yeah. haven't been as aggressive as the Fed and the ECB, and so that probably contributed to nervousness and skittishness in British financial markets. Yeah, I, I, I must say, I, I, I thought after the financial uh, uh, crash 2008 and 9, and we had all this uh, quantitative easing, I thought, well, quantitative easing is very easy, you know, you can do that, but how do you rein it back in again? And there's no sign that we've ever been reined back in. And uh, uh, interest rates stayed at emergency, emergency levels for uh, decades. And we think, wait a minute, this can't, this can't be right. And uh, you know, my kids complain about what they're uh, paying on their mortgages, but I still point out it's still negative. <laughs> so, um, you know, so that's the problem with bankers: is, is it's uh, you know, taking like a punch bowl uh, when the party is just going, going a bit too wild. <laughs> But uh, will it, you know, will central bankers ever be able to take what is punchable in the past is getting out of that? But there is this big discussion among uh, very quantitative minded, theoretical minded people about has the real rate of interest fallen because of the aging populations, savings from Asia, things yeah. like that. Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm more of a public finance guy, not as much of a monetary guy. So I don't pretend to know the answer to that, but there certainly seem to be some reasonable arguments that, okay, actually, if you look at charts, over hundreds of years, the real rate of interest has declined, probably because of lower risk premiums and stuff like that. Uh, but has it declined to zero or to negative, uh, which is what we've had? Uh, and, and that's, I think, where the problem with central banks is. You know, you, you refer to it as taking away the punch ball. The way I try to describe it in the US is that you know, we've had this step on the gas, hit the brakes, step on the gas, hit the brakes, monetary policy, yeah. this boom bust, and pretty much every major economic problem that we saw, at least in the United States over the last 100 years, ultimately gets tied to monetary policy. Uh, the Great Depression, uh, the inflation of the 60s and 70s, uh, the uh, financial crisis, and now I think in part what we're going through now, which, which hopefully won't be anything beyond just some 10% inflation and central banks will then begin to withdraw the excess liquidity and will limit the damage. Yeah. And maybe there'll be a short recession because that's part of the boom bust monetary cycle. But the problem is of course in the UK, that all happened while a new government came in mm -hmm. and tried to figure out ways to jumpstart growth and the two issues got tangled up and the narrative is going to be, I think, very unfriendly uh, to uh, for those of us who do believe in limited government and lower tax burdens. Well, I mean, uh, given that, I mean, how do classical liberals like ourselves respond to the to the challenge that their ideas are now discredited, really, uh, on, on the character, or the caricature that, um, oh, uh, you know, real free market? You know, a, a, a lot of people are on, on our side are saying, well, you know, real capitalism has never been tried. <laughs> <laughs> Which is true, but it just uh, you know, uh, pulls a lot of abuse on you. So, I mean, what is what should we be doing now, classical liberals? You know, what's our what's our agenda? How do we position ourselves? What should we be doing to improve public policy? Well, the good news, as an American, is that it's not going to be nearly as much of a problem for us because whatever economic hiccup we're going through, very few people are going to be familiar enough with what happened here to say, oh, well, they tried free markets and it yeah, failed. Yeah. Uh, and, and we have Biden in the White House, so if we have a hiccup, you know, a lot of people in the States, Biden's fault. <laughs> and, and, and I've actually written on several occasions that it's not Biden's fault that we have the current inflation because all that, that quantitative easing, that balance sheet expansion started a year before Biden took office. Yes. Uh, but here in the UK, You'll know the answer better than me. All I know is that it's, it has to be, uh, I would think it'd be very frustrating to see ideas being discredited yeah. when in reality, probably the Bank of England bears more of the blame. And then of course, for whatever reasons, okay, maybe uh, trusts uh, didn't roll out the plan correctly. Uh, maybe maybe Bailey at the Bank of England thought, okay, well, here's a way to sort of take the screw in because trust criticized mm -hmm. us during uh, her, uh, campaign for prime minister. I don't know all the ins and outs and, and uh, political machinations 
over on this side of the ocean. Uh, but I do know that narratives, once they're set, can be very bad. For decades, people uh, in the United States who are fighting for free markets had to deal with the myth that it was the Great Depression being caused by capitalism. And it's really only in the last 30 years that enough academic research has been conducted that that, that has sort of faded away. And then, of course, when the great financial crisis hit back in 2008, oh, it's Wall Street greed and capitalism run amok. Now, I think we actually did a much better job fighting that narrative from the beginning. Mm -hmm. We probably still on net lost the battle, but not nearly the way we suffered after the Great Depression, where there was sort of 40 years of statism unchallenged uh, because the left had been so successful in uh, writing the history on it. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I take your point about having to explain these things. So I ran into uh, Patrick Minford, Professor Patrick Minford, who was the arch sort of supply side, cut taxes and you'll get growth um, advocate in this country. And um, I said to him, uh, Patrick, you know, you seem to have crashed the economy. <laughs> <laughs> he said, no, he said, you have to explain these things. You know, she didn't explain it. They didn't explain it to the public. They didn't explain it to their own back benches, but it's not very surprising that, uh, you know, people just thought, what is this? You know, you're cutting taxes all over the place. There's all this um, uh, movement on the other side cutting, cutting expenditure as well. <laughs> this is, you know, how can this possibly work? And uh, I, I think there's a lot of truth in that. But, but let me uh, just say, I, I mean, one of the reasons that this started to unravel, I think probably is that there was a lot of pressure on uh, Liz Trust because the, uh, the uh, unfreezing bankers' bonuses and uh, uh, ending the 45% uh, prop tax rate. Uh, you know, people say, well, it's a tax on the rich and so on. And even if you go to the bank benches, many of whom are in northern seats that they've only just won and they, don't, they, they want to cultivate them. Uh, many of those people um, thought, oh, you know, we can't get away with that policy. That's just a ridiculous policy. And therefore, she U turn. So, I mean, do you think that was a decisive? Measure as well. I mean, maybe it's not your expertise, but I, I mean, do you, you think, you know, if, if we've got that kind of agenda, should we just stick to it and say, no, I'm not, I'm, not, yeah. I, I'm not a political scientist, I'm just a nerdy economist, but I, I think <laughs> having watched <laughs> up close US politics for four decades now, there's no question once you turn pale and show weakness, it's like putting blood in the water with uh, you yeah. know, hungry alligators or sharks. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. Everything was almost bound to unravel. Now, maybe things were going to unravel anyhow, and I think uh, uh, Professor Minford probably had some wise comments about there wasn't really much background information being provided. Uh, there certainly wasn't the context that, uh, you, know, you, know, you know, they should have been working with you guys and with other free market organizations uh, to sort of uh, you know, build the case uh, but obviously, yeah. Yeah. you win, all of a sudden, you're a new prime minister, there's been turmoil in the Tory party, and all of a sudden, you're trying to do something to get things going. And and a lot of people, I think, were more than happy to help push her <laughs> over the edge. Yeah, that's definitely true. Um, I, I think they, I, they probably thought that, goodness, right, we've got to have cold, cold an election in two and a half years or before. And uh, if we're going to show any benefits of the growth agenda, we've got to start right now. I think that was part, part of it. And I also think that um, they looked at, uh, I, I mean, Liz had failed um, reversing the corporation tax rise and, and the national insurance rise. But I think they probably realized that wasn't enough. That wouldn't actually you know, generate growth. It might stop us going into recession, but it wouldn't necessarily generate growth. And therefore, they, they thought they had to do more. And that, hence, I think the uh, the um, income tax cuts uh, you know, came, and I don't think it was, it, it didn't look to me as if it was well, well thought out. Did well, I, I think there's an analogy here that uh, uh, helps to explain why she did what she was trying to do. When Reagan came in office and he immediately pushed through his tax plan and the other economic reforms, and, and then you know, right as that was beginning to happen, we had the 82 recession, which I think was overwhelmingly the result of weaning inflation out of the system, nothing to do with fiscal policy. But in 82, Republicans suffered midterm losses. 
And all the analysis was, oh, Reagan's going to be a one-term president. Look, the supply side experiment's going to be a failure. But Reagan did stick to his guns. Uh, yes, we had the Tepper tax increase in 82 that maybe took away about 10 to 15 percent of the 81 tax cut. But by and large, he held firm. Uh, and by 84, of course, he wins a 49-state landslide. Because why? Because his policy agenda was the right policy agenda. The economy started growing rapidly, and all of a sudden, voters that two years before were giving him a 35% approval rate and, uh, and mock polls saying, of course, we're going to elect a Democrat in 84, those same voters uh, gave him a 60-40 landslide win. So there is something to the idea that you do something good, you do it as soon as possible because you want the effects to be visible to people. Yeah. So I don't blame uh, Truss uh, and her team for trying to do that. <clears throat> but certainly from the outside, it didn't look like the rollout was done very deftly. And I suppose there is another point that the supply siders, which nobody knows how to define that, but let's just throw it out there. There is an issue that supply siders don't deal with effectively, which is what are you doing on the spending side of the budget? The stereotype of supply siders in the US is that oh, all you guys want to do is cut taxes and then you just continue to spend and spend and who cares about deficits? Well, I actually don't really care that much about that because it's what I do care about spending. And there certainly are some supply siders in the US that are just willing to cut taxes and ignore the spending side of the budget. And, and to the extent that trust had this 60 billion or pound, whatever it was, energy subsidy yeah. package and had no even generic outline of somehow capping or controlling spending, I think that probably contributed to this feeling that maybe helped help make financial markets skittish about, well, is this just deficits as far as the eye can see? And right now everyone's thinking, well, Italy's on the verge of fiscal crisis. The moment the ECB stops buying while they're dodging debt, you know, do we want the United Kingdom to follow down that path? So, so on the so-called supply side side, I think there has to be some seriousness about the burden of public expenditure. And, and that's why I've been a big advocate of things like the spending cap that they have in Switzerland called the debt break, you know, something like that. Let government grow, but only two to three percent a year. And if nominal GDP is growing faster than that, you are going to bring down your deficit over time. Yeah, I mean, it's very interesting mm -hmm. that uh, all the eruptions that followed the mini budget, nobody suggested uh, ending the 60 billion pound uh, bailout for, uh, for energy. It was all about reversing the tax cut. But there we are. So look, I'm getting on a bit. So, um, is there any prospect for tax cuts in my lifetime? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're asking about tax cuts in the United Kingdom, I certainly think, uh, well, you probably know the answer better than I do anyhow, because it involves political judgments about what's happening in Westminster. Yeah. But here's the problem that we have, certainly not only in the UK, but also in the US and almost every Western country. Our demographics are terrible. Yeah. Our demographics are terrible in the sense that we're having fewer children we're living longer. I have gray hair. I want to live longer. And people should obviously have, a, have as many children as they want or don't want. But when you have welfare states that were set up on the assumption that you had very few old people, this population pyramid we probably learned about, very few old people, big generation of workers, mm -hmm. and even bigger generations of children, modest-sized, reasonably designed welfare states were financially feasible. Maybe not something I want as a libertarian, but they were financially feasible. Well, the problem is, as we're living longer, the top of the pyramid's going like this. We're having fewer children. The bottom of the pyramid's going like this. And guess what? Reasonably designed, modest welfare states are suddenly unreasonably defined and unaffordable. And we already have countries with 100% of GDP debt levels. And the demographics moving forward are terrible. And, and so the idea that we're going to get a lot of tax cuts in the future. I'm very pessimistic about it. I think the number one fight for, for fiscal conservatives, free market advocates, for the rest of my lifetime is going to be, is there something we can do that, that sort of cost curve of government spending? Can we somehow push it down simply to avoid the threat of massive tax increases? So we're going to be playing defense is what I'm afraid of. Mm -hmm. Now, I hope I'm wrong. I am hope some government someplace get the ball rolling with good pro-growth tax cuts that are designed well, and then there'll be evidence that, look, economy's growing faster, because it's not just the demographics. If you're 
real GDP, inflation adjusted GDP, is only growing one and a half percent a year, you're almost doomed to have fiscal crisis and economic problems in the, in the long run. We really do need to get economic growth up. There is a moral and economic case for more prosperity, more growth. And it involves, by the way, a lot more than lower taxes and spending restrictions. I mean, you have the land use issues here that, uh, from what I can tell, are much worse than what we have in the United States, except for in a few you know, cities in California. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have the, the, the NIMBY problem. And mm -hmm. it's particularly right in the Conservative Party, <laughs> <laughs> who all own big houses. <laughs> and therefore, they don't want to see any other houses built because they've done very nicely. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm, one, I'm not a Tory, but I'm one of them. <laughs> so, um, I mean, is there any way that one, one can overcome that kind of thing? Uh, we, we have to be presumably sneaky about uh, how, how we introduce supply side things. Are we ever going to get land reform in this country, do you think? Or? Or even in the United States. Well, let me give you an analogy. Uh, we do have something similar in the US. So, in, in cities with very restrictive zoning rules, uh, obviously the established homeowners like that. And they may be Republican homeowners. So, Republican politicians are, are leery. But probably the big issue in the US where this shows up is a school choice. There's been a lot of movement for school choice in the US. Uh, it's sort of been a breakthrough year. Uh, but for a long time, and by the way, for those who may not know, school choice simply means, okay, if the government's spending $15,000 a year to, uh, to have kids in government schools, why not give the parents a voucher for maybe like $7,000 and let them pick it whatever school they want, including the government school. So school choice is a way of creating competition and allowing more private education, which tends to have higher quality, better standards, stuff like that. But for a long time, school choice in the U.S., was held back. Why? Because a lot of Republicans who might otherwise be philosophically sympathetic, they represented well-to-do suburban school districts that where people felt, oh, we moved in here and our property values are high because we actually have a decent school district. So if you allow school choice, well, maybe our house values will fall or, or maybe something will happen where our school district won't be good and little Johnny and little Susie won't, won't have an advantage anymore. So yes, you, you know, the voters of your own party how, or movement may actually be obstacles if they see a financial incentive for the status quo. Yeah. You talked about the likelihood or unlikelihood of tax cuts. What about spending cuts? What's your uh, feeling on that? Because things will be going up and up and up and up and up. And, and there's a sort of democratic you know, principle there that it's, it's easier to give in to people and to give them some money. Yeah. Yes, and they don't have a political problem. We can move on. We do have government as Santa Claus, and Santa Claus is well represented in both parties. Uh, actually, I, I, I've crunched the data, and I've done it where I've taken out extraneous factors like one-time emergencies or wars, uh, and I've crunched the data, adjusted it for inflation, and it turns out that other than Reagan, on average over the last 60 years, Republicans have been bigger spenders than Democrats. Even if you take out defense spending on social welfare spending, with Reagan being the one notable exception, Republicans have been worse than Democrats. Now, I'm a big believer. I already mentioned the Swiss uh, spending cap, what they call a debt break. And we have one state in the US, Colorado, that has something called the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. Both of those policies or approaches are based on the idea that you're not cutting government, but you're putting it on a diet so it only grows two to three percent a year. And again, in a normal year, in a normal country, your nominal GDP, which of course is your tax base, is probably going to grow four or five percent, maybe only two percent real. But if your spending cap is nominal, you can actually make a lot of progress. And so if you look at the data ever since the Swiss debt break came in back in 2003, uh, it was enacted by a referendum of people, of course, not the politicians. But ever since the Swiss debt break came into, into force, government spending on average has only grown two percent a year in Switzerland. And while debt levels are going up all over in Europe, the Swiss government debt as a share of GDP has been coming down. So I think the debt break is a policy that has a very strong track record of success. Even left-leaning international bureaucracies like the IMF and OECD, when they've analyzed fiscal rules, they've said that expenditure limits, spending caps, whatever you want to call them, is the only policy that seems to work. The Maastricht criteria in Europe, utter failure. Balanced budget rules in 49 out of the 50 states, 
utter failure. They don't control the size of government. They don't control the growth of government. Uh, but the but spending limits, expenditure caps, again, whatever you want to call them, I don't care. That policy works. And I think it sounds reasonable to people because it is reasonable. We're, let's let government grow about the rate of population plus inflation, but not faster than that. It's kind of hard to argue that that's some sort of draconian, horrible policy. What politician, though, is either in Britain or America is going to uh, volunteer that sort of suggestion? I mean, uh, yeah, they'd, they'd be voting for an early Christmas. So you know, well, they couldn't be Santa Claus anymore, could they? <laughs> well, he, he, here's the problem. It, it sounds very reasonable, because I think it is reasonable to limit government to 2 to 3% growth. The problem is if you leave government on autopilot, and I assume that that is similar in the UK, in the US, government grows about 5% a year because of an aging population, the poorly designed entitlement program. So if you're putting in a spending cap, you're putting in a policy that will force politicians to change the structure of programs to stay within the cap. And that's where all of a sudden, oh, you're going to want to cut Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid, and you hate old people, and you know, <laughs> all, all, all the typical rhetoric that you get. But he, he, here's ultimately, he, here's what I think part of the fight is. If we don't wage this battle, and if we don't succeed in this battle, there's no alternative other than massive tax increases and economic stagnation. And with the demographics, I don't think any of that ends in a positive place whatsoever. So, so part of our challenge is we have to be prepared to make difficult, adult, intelligent arguments of what needs to be done. And we need to point out that anybody who opposes this necessarily is endorsing and embracing a very juristic agenda that is doomed to have negative consequences uh, for the economy. Uh, we have this fight in the U.S. because we have this movement now called national conservatism, uh, which is sort of you know the opposite of Reaganite libertarianism. Is this idea? Of, well, let's let's have a big activist government, but we'll control it. Well, I think that's kind of naive on their part. Uh, but I, I ask these people, okay, you're going to have more spending, you're going to have industrial policy, you're going to have child subsidies, all these things. How are you going to pay for it? What tax increases are you going to endorse? Because don't forget, you're embracing all this additional spending and government activism on top of everything that's already baked into the cake where government is growing and growing. And, and, and of course, they dodge that. Uh, now, of course, it's easy to dodge it because they're just saying, let's play Santa Claus on top of the current Santa Claus. But ultimately, that leads you to what Greece dealt with back in 2009, or what Italy, I think, is on the verge of dealing with if the ECB stops propping up their government bonds. Mm -hmm. um, are there areas in which we should actually increase government spending? Uh, that'd be very hard for me to give a yes answer. <laughs> <laughs> no. but, but I want to be clear. I'm not, I'm not the, a wild-eyed anarcho-capitalist. I'm just a wild-eyed normal libertarian. Uh, and, and in the modern world, I think one huge change that happened under Trump that was bipartisan is there's now much more of a view that China is a geopolitical enemy, not just a nation that's an aggressive trade law violator or something like that, but an actual geopolitical enemy. And, and if China is actually serious about invading Taiwan, and I have, I'm not a geopolitical expert, so I have no idea what the answer is on that, but maybe indeed the West does need to bolster its defenses. And of course, look what Putin is doing in Ukraine. Uh, now, traditionally, small government libertarians and small government conservatives always said, you know, the one definite legitimate function of a central government is the actual defense. So to me, that's not an unreasonable argument to make, assuming you actually do think that China and or Russia or whoever is a sincere, genuine threat to a global uh, harmony. Hmm. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, Canada, I think, in uh, sometime in the 90s. 91. Yeah, 91. Did, did a um, uh, basically a, a zero based survey of government spending, and they decided that uh, you know, subsidies to farmers should be cut, but pension should be increased. Um, so, did we need that sort of um, zero based, you know, complete rethink of government, of government policy? Or, I mean, if it, if it could ever happen, do you think that would be a good thing? Well, I think it'd be a good thing if we somehow copied Canada, because from 92 to 97, we basically had a nominal spending freeze in Canada. And during that five-year period, 
So a government deficit went from about 9% of GDP to a small surplus. And I've actually gone through the IMF's World Economic Outlook database, and I have mm -hmm. found countries that for multi-year periods had government growing at a nominal rate of 2% a year or less. And in every single case, the deficits came down, the burden of government spending as a share of GDP came down, and they had success. Not only success economically, but oftentimes governments got reelected uh, uh, with those kinds of policies. And whenever I'm debating some of my left-wing friends on panels and conferences around the world, and I show I have a chart that shows all these countries, I tell them, okay, show me your chart, your list of countries that had success with tax increases. And of course, there's what we say in the U.S. is crickets, the sound of silence, <laughs> because if they don't have any answer. So, so you know, we have the advantage of academic and, and empirical evidence on our side. We have the disadvantage of telling people a story that there's no Santa Claus, and and we have to fight that battle because if we don't, Greece. Yeah. Um, the. Previous Prime Minister uh, thought we could uh, dash for growth and uh, not worry too much about um, increasing the debt because uh, that needed to be done. I mean, we needed to have the growth agenda and then we look for it now and uh, we can make it better off and, and we'll be able to repay it uh, in due course. Um, do you think that that's a, a, a plausible strategy or not? Is, it, is there a case for borrowing to fund a, a pro growth agenda or is that a mistake? Assuming one defines a pro-growth agenda properly, I mean, Joe, Joe Biden claims his agenda is pro-growth. So, you know, obviously, we, we want to make sure we get that initial discussion out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> I have never worried about deficits in the short run. I, mean, I, I focus much more on just the size of government and the structure of the tax system. Uh, but I do think you want to keep your eye on the ball in the long run because if you do have a policy where, where, well, let me put it this way. If you cut taxes at the top, there are big supply side responses and a lot of revenue feedback. If you cut taxes at the bottom, where you tend to have wage income instead of investment income, the supply side response isn't as great. So if you have broad-based tax cuts for everyone, they're, they're definitely not going to pay for themselves. So you're going to lose some revenue. Now, I think that's good because my, I, I've never woken up and, they, and thought to myself, how can I maximize revenue for government? So I don't mind the idea of taking revenue away from government, but if you're going to do that politically and in the long run, economically, you do need to marry that with some sort of spending restraint. Now, again, it's not just taxes and spending, regulatory policy, trade policy, land policy. Uh, there are all these other things that contribute or can contribute to the economy doing better or worse, depending on what politicians are, are doing. So I'm in favor of not worrying about the deficit if I genuinely think politicians are doing something that'll have a really good payoff for the economy. Uh, I just, I, I always suspect that they'll exaggerate when they do that. Uh, and, uh, and therefore, and if they don't have anything to say on the spending side, then I get very suspicious that they just want to be the conservative version of Santa Claus as opposed to the left-wing version of Santa Claus. I was going to ask you um, what you thought the UK economy might look like after a few more years of uh, high spending <clears throat> and uh, not very much supply-side uh, uh, action. Uh, but I, I think you answered that by saying Greece. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, um, I, I mean, are you optimistic that that sort of uh, Fate could be resisted either here or in the United States? Or do you think it's just going to get worse and worse? Operationally, I'm an optimist. Realistically, I'm a pessimist. Okay. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> what is economic growth? There are two components to real GDP growth. One is just population. So if your population is growing 1% a year, your economy real terms grows 1% a year, there's obviously no increase in real per capita GDP. The other component of GDP growth is productivity. Productivity is what allows us to get more out of our current resources and makes us richer. So if you're an economist, and you know, I don't often agree with Paul Krugman, but I think he said something about productivity isn't everything, but in the long run, 
nothing else matters. I, I'm sure I'm butchering the quote, but he's right. You have to have productivity growth. But if you have a heavily regulated economy with land use restrictions and tax rates that discourage entrepreneurship and government spending programs that are creating dependency and luring people out of the labor market, you know, those are all things that are hurting productivity. And, and there's a concern right now uh, that when you look at the long run productivity and the OECD just came out with reports looking at how productivity numbers between now and 2060, they're certainly projecting very little potential productivity increases if we have the status quo. So I think there is a strong case for trying to shake things up, try to create more entrepreneurship in societies. I just don't think that Republicans in the US have what it takes to do it. And I worry that Tories now in the UK don't really have an agenda that's going to do it. Because if your whole agenda is let's mollify voters, give them <clears> things, <throat> where are you going to get the growth out of that? Uh, and I think we certainly saw that under Trump, where he was perfectly happy to spend more on everything and also give some tax cuts. I like the tax cuts. Uh, <laughs> but, but again, the, the, the tax cuts that are married with spending increases are probably not very sustainable. And if you believe in the rational expectation school of economics, investors and entrepreneurs aren't even going to trust that the tax cuts are going to have are going to be around, and therefore they're not going to invest as much. Mm -hmm. um, all right, I've been uh, asking all the questions. I'm going to put my face up now, and uh, you can ask the questions. Yes, come on over the back. Yeah, um, we were mentioning briefly downstairs, Dan, about the concerns that you've had, and you've had them for a long time, about how major governments around the world, either through forums like the G20 or the OECD, which, by the way, the people who work there don't pay tax, um, are trying <laughs> to harmonize major tax rates to prevent so called harmful tax competition. Uh, we've already had Mr. Biden try to do this with, with corporate taxes at 15%, which obviously didn't go down very well with the Irish, which is 11%, or indeed a uh, place like Malta, where they don't have that. Um, and also, I suspect that there may be elements of this being tried with the things like income tax and capital gains tax. I know that you've, you've written about this before, the whole book about it, I've read it. How concerned are you get from now on? That this is a reality and this is only going to gather momentum? Um, or is there anything that can be done to try to point out to people that this, this is going to, not going to end well? Or what can be done about it, assuming that it's, it's still a thing? All right, well, just in case our, our online audience didn't hear the question, it's about governments trying to cartelize the tax system, do things like global minimum taxes. Uh, and I understand why they're doing it. I was just talking about the demographic outlook being very grim, aging populations. Well, politicians know the same data. They see that they have people who brief them on the long run numbers. So if you're a politician who doesn't want to control spending, you want to figure out how to make it easier to raise taxes. In a globalized economy, it's sometimes not easy because the geese with the golden eggs can fly away. And so you want to figure out how to make sure that your taxpayers can't go to Cayman or Monaco, or Bermuda, or Ireland, or Singapore, or Hong Kong. And that indeed was unquestionably the reason that the OECD came out with its uh, so-called harmful tax competition project back in 2000. It's unquestionably the reason that Biden and our Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen have climbed into bed with the Europeans to push for this global corporate minimum tax. And I think you're exactly right that if they get this thing signed, sealed, and delivered, at 15%, two things are gonna happen. They're immediately gonna start agitating for, well, 15% is too low because it's unfair that rich fat cat corporations aren't paying more. And then the second thing they're gonna do is say, this is such a good idea and we have such crying needs for additional revenue to make sure that uh, retirees can have health care and pensions. We need to do this to individual income taxes, capital gains taxes, maybe do it for wealth taxes, you name it. So, so Everything that we see and understand and, and, and use as a reason to try to control spending, some of our friends on the left see the exact same thing and say, we need to try to harmonize taxes so it's easier for governments to try to grab more revenue to make this happen. But even if they succeed, by the way, in harmonizing taxes, what's that going to do to productivity? Because ultimately, I, I think their approach maybe props them up for five years or 10 years, 
but ultimately with productivity going down, population aging going up, that just doesn't work in the long run. So I think they can buy themselves more time, but ultimately they're putting their countries on a path to economic and fiscal disaster. Uh, somebody wants to back. Yes. All right, thank you. Um, I was going to ask about we have in the UK, we have probably the most free market for the Prime Minister and Chancellor in my lifetime, certainly. And they were out of office uh, in 45 days. Uh, of a ten of the morning period. <laughs> <laughs> what what do we have to do differently next time? Is it that I'm former into the economic affairs? Is it that organisations like the IEA and the Adam Smith Institute didn't prepare the ground enough? What and is there any hope of of something of, of a renaissance within the next ten fifteen years? Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'll leave it to uh, Eamon to, uh, to analyze uh, the domestic political environment uh, over here. I will say in the U.S., let me give you something pessimistic and then something optimistic. During the Obama years, I basically spent all those eight years working with Republicans on Capitol Hill to sort of prepare them for genuine entitlement reform. And Republicans took the House in 2010, they took the Senate in 2014, and they started passing budgets that were predicated <coughs> on genuine Medicaid and Medicare reform. Not Social Security, but Medicaid and Medicare <coughs> were actually a bigger problem anyhow. And I was getting all excited. You know, you know we've, we've actually gotten through to them, and many of them, I think, were genuinely sincere. Because, of course, that was shortly after Greece blew up, and so there was, there was some sensitivity and understanding of the fact that countries couldn't tax us then forever. Uh, and, and so I thought, okay, I'll get congressional Republicans on board with this idea. And then in 2016, maybe we'll have a Republican president. And 17 Republicans ran for president. 16 of them were in favor of retirement reform. And guess what? <laughs> <laughs> Everything I worked on just blew up because Trump was, you know, he, he basically got in office by being a protectionist and being anti-immigration and, and just, just being... Trump. Uh, and, uh, and, and so, you know, yes, we got some tax cuts. He was happy to play that part. But other than that, he, he you know, again, just like other Republican presidents under the race, he increased domestic spending faster than Obama did. You know, so, so that, that was my frustration. Good news while Republicans were winning Congress, bad news when we got a, the one Republican nominee who wasn't good on the issue. But now, if Republicans sweep the House and Senate, which the political odds makers are now saying is likely, I'm going to spend the next two years doing exactly what I did during the Obama years. Uh, and if someone like Governor DeSantis, as opposed to Trump, wins the White House, maybe maybe my, my dreams that crashed on the rocks of reality in 2016 will somehow be rejuvenated in 2024. But then again, you know, maybe I'll Buy a lottery ticket worth a hundred million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Why will the Santos do that? Why do you believe that the Santos is going to have that view? Well, I, I, I've actually talked to him about it back when he was a member of Congress, uh, and, his, and his track record as a governor in Florida yeah. has been pretty good. Uh, now, do I ever fully trust anything a politician says? No, I don't even halfway trust it. But, but, but. I don't want to make it seem like all politicians are just totally malicious and short-sighted, self-serving, you know what. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the cartoons where there's a moral quandary and a cartoon angel pops up on one shoulder and a devil on the other shoulder. You know, politicians, they sometimes will do the right thing for the right reason if you somehow can convince them they're not committing suicide by doing it. Uh, so I don't know. All I know is it's my job to try to stop bad things from happening and to help good things happen. So I'm gonna I'm gonna work on it and maybe I'll be disappointed because I often am. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I'm permitted a, a short answer to the to the question. Um, I think things have been an awful lot worse. I mean, people are talking about free markets these days, <laughs> even if they're rushing it. But but uh, you know, in the in the late seventies when we started, nobody was even talking about free markets. Wasn't on the agenda. It was it was a foreign idea. 
Um, so I think that we've been uh, a lot worse. And I think actually the economic situation has been a lot, a lot worse as well. This isn't a great depression again. It's not even a, the, the financial crash of 2008. It, it doesn't seem to be that, that bad. Um, so you know, things will come up again and uh, our ideas will come up again. And in the meantime, you know, we have to pursue uh, our agenda by whatever means um, are um, viable. Uh, that you know, that there's a whole supply side agenda out there. Lots of little small tweaks that we could make that would make a huge difference in terms of uh, growth and, and getting rid of obstacles to growth, as you said. Um, and uh, we can do all that. And I think we, you know, that, that's what we're doing. And I think tanks don't exist to, um, if you like, convince the general public. I mean, yes, we have a, an effect in terms of putting stuff on the agenda. Uh, that then gets discussed, and that might move the over the window. Um, but it's truly really for politicians to justify their, their policy. And I'm afraid in, in this case, there just wasn't enough time for that to happen. Uh, yeah, so give them that. Yeah. Yes, my question is about timing. So, if we want to find out whether it's true that lowering taxes can lead to growth and um, a greater standard of living for people in general, what would be the ideal timing? Because I would argue that the recent experiment, the entire timing was decided by politics. It just happened to be there was a leadership contest that one, one of the candidates commented low tax and got the job for that reason, basically. Um, but maybe it wasn't the right timing. So is the, is the, is the concept flawed or was the timing flawed? And if the, if the timing was flawed, when would be the ideal time to, to try these policies? I might agree with you that the timing was flawed, but only in the sense that trust was the victim of bad luck. And, and let's do a hypothetical. Mm. The US had this double dip recession in 80 and 82. All I think in retrospect, I think there's widespread agreement it was weaning inflation out of the system was the overwhelming cause of that uh, double dip recession. But what if the second part of that double dip recession started the day after Reagan got elected, or the day after he introduced the Economic Recovery Tax Act. And what if then the same narrative that you guys just dealt with here happened in the US in 81, where, oh my God, Reagan introduced the tax cut package, and all of a sudden the stock market's gone down 20%. Look at that, the unemployment rate has gone up to 10.3%. We had a fairly deep recession in 82. If that had happened in 81, and somehow it was it coincided in a way where Reagan's opponents and, and you know, there was vicious opposition to what Reagan was trying to do. Uh, Reagan's entire package may have blown up uh, right then and there. So I, I think trust is the victim of bad luck. I think she's the victim of a, of a financial system that was that was a little bit shaky because of bad monetary policy and people in the markets trying to figure out, okay, how fast and when is the Bank of England going to tighten and try to undo its mistakes uh, you know, that stem back from the pandemic easing. Uh, but other than that, I, what, what we were talking about earlier, the sooner you do good things, the sooner you get the good results. And if you're thinking, oh, I want to get reelected in two and a half years, you know, there, there was a very strong, obvious reason for to try to do good policy right away. Uh, two more speedy questions. Uh, let's see, the gentleman has been uh, asking for a long time. Yeah, go on. Okay. Um, I'm intrigued with the rise of digital money which basically kind of dissem disseminates from central banks to private banks. Um, whether or not you see the demise of central banks as we go to cashless society, and whether you see that as a good thing or a bad one, if we're allowing private banks to basically kind of run the money supply. Uh, I am much more fearful that digital money, if we move to a cashless society, the, the, the two, biggest groups pushing for that other than libertarians who think it somehow will help them the two biggest groups are tax collectors who think aha cashless society is easier for us to track and tax money and then it's the keynesians who think if everyone has digital money we can in effect impose a negative interest rate on them if they don't go out and spend so i think digital money uh unless it truly is private out of it but even you know do you actually, if you have Bitcoin or some digital currency, do you really think the government can't get to you? 
Uh, no, so I, I, I'm not talking crypto. It is purely digital. Yeah. So, they, 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 so we're talking government digital money. Keep in mind that the advocates of it are pushing that for two reasons, because they think it'll make Keynesian policy easier, because mm -hmm. they'll just take money out of our account if we don't go out and spend it like those little Keynesians. <laughs> and they're going to figure out how to track and tax everything that we do. Uh, so I'm, I'm not uh, I'm not filled with optimism about what that might be. But we've got the 3% here in Britain. Okay. One last question. It's still there, though. Yeah, yeah. I mentioned those windows, obviously very important in the political philosophy, but obviously the economic as well. And we're saying now we hear audible gas trying to talk about tax cuts, it's a bad word, it's a sticky. How do we change that? How do we stop the IMF telling us that cutting taxes to 21 levels is going to reduce inequality? How are we going to make it trendy again for free markets and not create this kind of you know peace that Keynes is doing the blue? Well, I, I wish I had a good answer to that question. Which is, uh, you know, how do we make tax cuts saleable, especially when it's oh, we're cutting taxes for the rich or something like that? Now, earlier we got a question pointing out that OECD bureaucrats pushing for tax harmonization get tax free salaries. The IMF bureaucrats who are pushing for tax increases also, guess what? They get tax free salaries as well. Uh, I think international bureaucracies play a very pernicious role in the global economy. There was a period. Uh, at the end of the last century, under the so-called Washington Consensus, where those international bureaucracies were actually maybe semi-helpful because they were pushing deregulation, trade openness, lower marginal tax rates in uh, developing and transition economies. But all this century, the IMF and the OECD have been among the most harmful uh, entities in terms of pushing a, a bureaucratic agenda. Uh, now, that's not answering your question about how we make it cool and trendy again, but ultimately you put your finger on the uh, on the real issue. The left is consumed by inequality. They actually <clears throat> seem to think the economy is a fixed pie. Now, that's not true. I mean, look at how much richer we are than our ancestors were 100 years ago and 200 years ago. Obviously, the pie can grow, <clears throat> but, but there's something in the mindset of the left where they assume that if Bill Gates gets rich, the rest of us get poor. And somehow that's an issue where, where we don't, we need to come up with better and stronger arguments. Uh, I'm always experimenting with that. I don't think I have the right answer, but if, you know, between the Adam Smith Institute and the IEA and the American think tanks, if we don't begin to figure this out and we enter a world where the vast majority of voters think that a rich person comes at their expense, uh, then we're going to be in trouble. We're going to lose all yes, our Yes, but his money might mean power and influence. That's what they're fighting about. Not the fact of how much money we've got in the bank. Well, there, there, there is a semi-sophisticated argument on the left that, oh, okay, maybe maybe the pie can get richer, but if there's someone who's rich, just by definition, that's bad because they have more power. Yeah, but, uh, I have come across that argument, but I, I don't think it's the main part of their yeah. agenda. Um, Prince, uh, the uh, optimists among you uh, can join us for a glass of wine down. <laughs> <laughs> the rest throw themselves out of the window. <laughs> I think they can probably say about the hemlock. But it's Halloween. I would like to thank on your behalf uh, Dan Mitchell for uh, coming and uh, giving us his uh, considerable uh, wisdom on a very difficult uh, yes. situation. Yeah. Uh, so thank you very much. For